large women in plus size clothing uh, everywhere I went on the web. Uh, but it's gotten much smarter since then. Sounds like my actual life. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So we're going to talk about integrating and retargeting uh, with a complete mix of marketing automation, in this case part of e-commerce, not one but three separate instances of Salesforce, and a whole unifying marketing data backend and much more. Um, maybe you should start, Carolyn, um, with a little bit of context. Um, talk a little bit about what you do, what you sell, um, and who you do it for. Yeah, great. Thanks, John. Uh, so I run the e-commerce business for HP Software. It's about $4 billion in revenue annually. It's quite significant, though we're the little-known organization within HP. Uh, we've been building a whole new brand, identity, and web platform for marketing and selling our software online. So I came into HP about a year and a half ago. Before that, I was with Yahoo and also with IBM. And I have a brand new organization of talent. I've brought in lots of folks from the outside, from companies like LinkedIn, Salesforce, Yahoo, uh, Atlassian, and New Relic, some of the more um, innovative B2B companies or consumer internet companies. Uh, the types of software that we offer on our platform include application security, development, testing, and monitoring software, big data and analytics as well. So the interesting thing that I was thinking about when we were talking earlier was that you're selling B2B, you're selling big ticket software to large companies in some cases, in other cases some smaller companies or startups, um, but you're, you're, you've built a team that's very B2C, you've built a team that's very consumer oriented, um, and you're taking uh, a consumer oriented approach. Can you talk about that a little bit in terms of why and, and how you decide on that and yeah. what it works? Yeah. Uh, so that was definitely on purpose, going after B2C to talent, folks from mostly consumer internet background. Um, I mentioned to John and Adam before, I see what consumer internet was doing maybe 10, 15 years ago that B2B enterprises are trying to do now. Um, and what I mean by that is around the focus on the end user or customer ultimately. So when I first walked into HP, a lot of the product marketers I spoke with said, hey, you know, Carolyn, we've got personas. We target CEOs, CISOs, CTOs, and CIOs. And I said, okay, where are the actual hands-on people who are using our software? And they said, well, we just, we just haven't gone after the, those folks and we don't really know how to. And so consumer internet has always been focused on that end user. We're watching you know, every movement on a website, tracking all the online activity, seeing conversions. We can see all of that engagement. So really going after consumer. Uh, even though you're in a B2B play, as one, one thing I mean by what Consumer Internet was doing 10 to 15 years ago that b 2 is doing today. I think another one is around rapid iteration, development, and feeding and learning of insights back into your marketing and into your product development, into uh, any, any kind of activities where you're trying to grow and, and learn and improve. Um, that, that is really key as well. So um, you're using retargeting in, uh, for three separate purposes. Talk a little bit about those and why retargeting works for those. Yeah. So Adam's team has been great to work with. I think we're guinea pigs. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we implemented audience development. Uh, it's given us a great opportunity to reach more segments of brand new customers uh, than I think we ever have before. So we can go after publishers that Admiral now works with to pixel their sites um, and for us to go over, go after particular users of certain job titles, industries, or categories. This expands our reach beyond just retargeting of someone who comes through our site. Um, so that's been a tremendous initiative for us and very interesting to see, to see the metrics soon. It's still early. I would say one other thing that we're doing with Admiral is around uh, how do we figure out what people are doing across the purchase plot funnel on our site and how do we actually target them with the right type of content at the right time. So for example, we know when someone actually signs up for trial and is using our product. And that essentially is the pivot point for us to decide whether we want to focus someone on product information and content or whether we want to give them advertising around purchasing the product. So we're watching them all the way through the funnel. We've worked with AdRoll on segmenting those users and being able to retarget them depending on the activity engagement of the site. And then, of course, A-B testing is a layer across everything that we do, too. Cool, cool. So Adam, um, we talked a little bit about multi-device. It's a multi-device world. I'm on one right now. You're on different one during the day, et cetera, et cetera. And you talked a little bit about the ability to retarget, regardless of which, which device somebody is actually using. 
Can you talk a little bit about how that works and, and, and how that's helpful? Sure, yeah, I mean, so our mission as a company is to help businesses uh, collect their most valuable data asset, which is their customer data, uh, segment it in ways that make sense for their business and act on it wherever people go. Um, and increasingly, people are spending more time on mobile devices, we all know that. The problem is that connecting the dots between what somebody does on the desktop machine and then what they do on a mobile device, whether it be a phone or a tablet or a phablet, and whether that be in the, in, the, in the browser environment or the app environment or Android and I, you can drive yourself absolutely crazy. It's, there's probably 12 people in the world that understand all the intricacies <laughs> and how you can tie all those different things together from a targeting perspective, from a tracking perspective, from an attribution perspective. So, so the, the way I, what, what I generally recommend marketers uh, do is think about it in terms of like, what is my marketing objective? Don't, don't say I want to be on, you know, uh, Safari for the sake of being on Safari. What am I trying to actually accomplish? Am I trying to drive app downloads? Okay, that's something that we can then talk about. How can we leverage your, your data? What data can we leverage to drive app downloads? Okay, I have a lot of app downloads, but I'm not, I'm not seeing the engagement that I want. Okay, great. How can we identify a segment of users uh, that we want to re-engage, and then where can we re-engage them? So, you know, the, I think the, the, the fragmented, the problem with the fragmented user can really only be solved in thinking about it from the point of view of what is my marketing objective, instead of saying, okay, where are all the little nuggets and, and uh, problems and places where it breaks down, because it does. So what does that mean practically? Um, if I'm on my laptop during the day and I research something about one of Karen's solutions, and then I have to be on my tablet on the sofa in the evening. Yeah. Um, how does that work practically? Yeah, I mean, it could work practically in a number of ways. Um, from, from our point of view, what we've decided to do is take an approach of definitive IDs um, and leverage our partnerships with um, folks like Facebook and Twitter to uh, uh, evolve our to, to evolve our targeting around that definitive user ID. Yeah. Um, and so that is the that is the kind of the easiest, most straightforward, 100% close to uh, accurate way to say, okay, that person is logged in on Facebook on desktop. We know we now know who that person is when they're on their mobile device. We've got this nice, native, engaging ad unit on their mobile phone we can use for a mobile app install ad, or maybe a piece of content if it's a B2B advertiser. Um, so there's a number of ways we can solve the problem. But then I would, I would kind of turn around, like, yeah, practically it can work in a number of ways depending on what you're actually trying to accomplish. So, That's a good question. Let's ask Carolyn that. How does that change your marketing and advertising behavior based on whether somebody might be here or on their tablet or on their laptop and time of day? Yeah. So we do offer a few software products in the space of mobile development and mobile performance testing. So for those particular users or visitors to our site, we are tracking whether they're coming in through a tablet, mobile device, and browser, or desktop. Uh, and for those particular users, we are targeting them more heavily with those solutions. Um, so that, that's one of the things we do look at. I would say that in general though, um, software is not usually something that's easy to download on a tablet or a mobile device uh, just yet, except for the mobile solutions we have to offer. So there's some focus on that right now, uh, but not for all of our portfolio just yet. So um, when Retarget first came out, you know, it was pretty um, interesting, cool, and, and it was something you did sort of over there, and you got some results, and okay, that was cool. You've integrated into an entire complex uh, web of technologies that you talked about. You talked about part of it, you talked about three instances of Salesforce, you talked about, I think it was Vertica, and your backend and everything. Can you talk about how you've integrated that, and how you use that uh, in building your customer journeys? Yeah. So I think the Admiral team has faced this because we've been working with them on implementation of tracking all the way so we can see the whole entire customer journey and view of the funnel through to bookings and revenue. That's really important for us, not just pipeline, but bookings and revenue, what happens after that even around renewals. And we've got about 15 sources of data including three from three different instances of Salesforce that we use. We have a very complex business, very large business at HP Software. So it just so happened that we were on three different systems. Uh, we were looking to consolidate, but ultimately, as you can see, that prospect lead information is sitting in different places, opportunity data is sitting in different places. And we want to tie that all the way back to the campaigns that we're running. Um, so we have partnered with Good Data. Uh, which runs Vertica, which is one of our software analytics platforms used by Facebook, Facebook and Zenga. And uh, we've put that all into one place so we can have one source of truth 
and a BI intelligence and analytics reporting warehouse to give us that, that intuitive view. Cool. And you told me, and this kind of ties into what you are just talking about, that you're maniacal about data. Um, <laughs> can you ever have too much? <laughs> yeah, sometimes you get up too much and you can't analyze it. Uh, but yes, we are maniacal about data. We uh, look at all of the activity all the way through. I mentioned that into one customer view down to revenue bookings and renewals. Um, we're also looking kind of pre-purchase at whether someone engages and responds back to technical engagement managers that we have. Um, so we have a hybrid pre-sales, sales development, inside sales model where we do reach out and day one, day three, day 10, if someone hasn't responded or if they do, we're tracking those responses, what kinds of questions they have, do they need technical help or not, um, and trying to see how we can resolve that and uh, engage with the customers and, and continue on from there. Interesting. Um, when we talked earlier, Adam, you are talking about conversions aren't always just conversion events that we've traditionally thought about. Um, and, and that's certainly especially true in the complex B2B environment, right? It, it's not somebody buying a pair of shoes and, and there's the ad and then you visit the site, you see it again, you see, oh, I'll buy the pair of shoes. It, it's multiple. Can you talk about that multiple stage? Yeah, effect? well, sure. I mean, there's a couple things I would say about that. One, it, it sort of starts to open up a topic of attribution, which is a, probably a whole other panel. Um, you know, I, I would say you know those metrics are, are incredible and, and amazingly detailed and in depth, um, and, and I'm sure it's take a lot of time to get that uh, data data sanitation in place. Um, I mean, my, my recommendation in general when I talk to customers using platform implementing multi uh, you know multi channels from a marketing perspective is just when you're thinking of attribution, when you're thinking of measurement, not to let per perfection be the enemy of good, um, and knowing you know okay using pure last click uh, and separating each channel in silo, we know that's wrong. How can we make that slightly better um, and not uh, paralyzing ourselves, waiting to know, okay, well this uh, you know, mobile touch point had exactly a 10% contribution on the fact that they've become a lead and then we don't know till three months later how valuable that, you know, you're, you're, you're never gonna be able to make decisions and, um, and improve, so you know, kind of making iterative steps uh, from that perspective and then kind of getting back to the actual <laughs> root of your question, you know, what are some of the other uh, things that we see people do? I mean, from a, from a, from a B2C perspective, um, there's uh, the most underutilized uh, segment I think that people look at is existing customers. There's a little bit of this notion of like exclusion lists and things of that, like that in, in retargeting. Um, you know, there's the old axiom that it's, what, five times less expensive to retain an existing customer than it is to convert a new one. Start with that conversion segment. What can you do with that? Are there other products that they might be, not, maybe not right away, but um, should you keep that pool of users going so that when you have a sale or a launch a new product, you do a more broad campaign? So all sorts of creative things you can do with your customer data on the, um, on the B2C side, uploading CRM segments, matching that to uh, uh, cookies or uh, social IDs, and creating messages for dormant users that haven't even been to your site in a while. You know, so we call that CRM retargeting. And then on the B2B side of things, I think retargeting is an awesome opportunity for content marketing. Uh, particularly when you combine programmatic advertising with some of these nice native ad units that are in feed, like Facebook's news feed, like Twitter's um, timeline. People are used to consuming content there, so don't, don't necessarily shove a conversion event down the person's throat. Give them uh, content, which they're used to consuming in that environment, bringing them through the funnel, uh, but doing so in a really targeted, really intelligent way um, so that you know what you're providing to them is interesting to them, is, is useful, and is going to provide your thought leadership and, Kind of help them help frame the messaging the way you want them to be thinking about. That's really cool. That's awesome insight. Appreciate that. Um, you mentioned that you use Vertica on the back end to kind of tie everything together, have one source of truth. Can you talk a little bit briefly about what goes in and what comes out? I mean, we we get so much data. We have so many dashboards. We have so many different campaigns we're doing in many many different places with many many different companies. Um, what's that look like? A little bit, if you can. Yeah. So. Every, uh, all of our marketing mix uh, across all channels, so even PR type events, um, information from leads that we capture goes into this database um, and this warehouse. And we are looking at uh, basic reporting data, but uh, I think more importantly, we're looking at analytics information to help drive uh, decisions that we want to make or actions that we want to take. Um, so one very specific example of something that I can get out of our BI platform 
is around uh, the, the content marketing piece. So the nurturing and creation of campaigns where we go and retarget folks based on the activity they've done on the site. Uh, we've actually seen uh, improvements by normalizing spend between display retargeting uh, along with SEM. We actually have seen a 10% increase in downloads of a particular white paper for a product with Get This, which is, I think, even uh, more outstanding, which is a, a decrease in cost per download by 40% compared to SEM. So 10% increase in downloads, but at 40% off. Um, that's, that's been one tremendous insight that tells us, hey, we should go spend more here. Excellent, cool. So those are some metrics, and my next question was gonna be about some metrics, and do you have any others that you can share in terms of why do you do retargeting? What kinds of ROI do you see on that? Yeah, uh, retargeting. I think just uh, based on based on this definition, we see just greater uh, potential to convert. So that probability to convert because there's been some kind of prior engagement that we see somewhere, and now it's not just on our website but everywhere else with other publishers. It's just so important for us to be able to heavily optimize and go after the individuals or the end users of our software that we want, and in mass too. Um, so no longer do we just wine and dine the CEOs, the CISOs, the CTOs, and reach out individually. We have our field reps doing that with our large accounts, but we can go after lots of different people in a very targeted way online. And it's really cool because you never know who actually makes the ultimate decision, why that person makes that decision, who brought that to him or to her, and what, what happened to make that happen. Cool. Um, Adam, I wanted to um, ask you a question about something that Carolyn talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it used to be when you wanted to retarget, um, you put some code on your website, um, you let it sit there for a while, uh, maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, depends how much traffic you have, and then you had some opportunity to retarget. Um, Carolyn mentioned something about, I forget what the name of it was, audiences or whatever it was, but the ability to essentially choose some audiences that you wanted to quote unquote retarget. Can you talk a little about how that works with this? We have, we have a ton of stuff in that area right now that are kind of in the early stages of alpha that I, that I won't talk about, but I, I will, um, a lot of it will be coming very soon. Um, I'm probably getting called on it. Um, but uh, it, it fits in very much to our, our viewpoint that retargeting isn't simply uh, let's identify this set of users and then just like keep uh, showing them you know, the shoes that they looked at. That this is a, a data set that we want to leverage in a very intelligent way. Um, and when you think of that, think of it from that perspective, there are all sorts of other other ways you can extend that data set that still ties to the, the intent. Um, and I think identifying uh, publishers that also share intent signals um, with your audience is a great way to start moving up the funnel. You think of retargeting as the very bottom of the funnel. These are people who are aware of your brand. They're, you know they're in market. They've been to the site. There's kind of one circle outside of that that are that are that are that are those users are also showing intent for things that are related to your product. And you can start capturing proprietary audiences by identifying the right publishers, collecting that data, and then adding that as a as a layer to your retargeting campaigns. Cool. And I see that we're out of time. Um, so thanks so much, Adam. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. John, I still maintain I pronounce your name wrong.